Well, introduce yourself, man. You're in an in a interesting line of work, and that's what prompted me to to reach out. Well, uh, for over 30 years, I've been working with a sustainability research center uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, our our mission is to demonstrate how to feed, fuel, and clothe people on marginal land. And so we've been stewarding 120 acres on the eastern side of the Cascade Wilderness uh, as we test out uh, various facilities and post the information on our website and, and so on. We've been doing this for a long time. And, and part of that is what got us into uh, natural organic reduction. Uh, part of it is also uh, natural burial. Uh, in Washington state, you may not be buried on your own land. Mm. And so uh, if you want to be, uh, if you have a sentimental attachment to a piece of property uh, and you don't want to go off and be buried in a commercial cemetery, uh, your only option is natural organic reduction. And so we can take someone's body and transform it into compost, and then they can take that back and use it on their own land. And so... Uh, that's what we've been doing here uh, for over 30 years. What got uh, you into this uh, this line of work? So I had no idea. I thought you were just in natural organic reduction. So I had no clue that there was a whole another side to the, to the uh, sustainability piece. Well, the issue of, you know, uh, death is part of life. And I joined this organization back in 1973. And so most of the people who were principals at that time have passed on. It's just a part of if you have a sustainable operation and structure, then you have to deal with the death issue, mm -hmm. aging and, and so on. So how do you we used to do that with extended families where, you know, people cared for people as they got older uh, and the young people took on and went forward. But that option is now gone pretty much. And so how do we set up something that uh, will provide for us as we get older? Uh, and facilitate and train and support a, a new generation coming in. Those are fundamental questions that have just kind of gotten forgotten. Mm. And so how to explore back in what is the historical uh, record or what are the options? How can we, with greater understanding and resources, uh, take advantage of the old and wed it to the new and go forward? So that's kind of what we've done with natural organic reduction. So, uh, so we, we work with animals that convert things we don't want to eat into things we do want to eat. That's part of the basis of agriculture, arguably. Uh, and we're not a farm for the sake of selling anything. We're a farm for the sake of learning and interacting in a hands-on uh, way that is holistically appropriate for the animals as well as the people. And so sorting that out. And so... Uh, if one of our 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 youths, for example, is a good mother and a good leader and maintains that part of the organization effectively, she's welcome to stay throughout her life. And eventually when she dies, uh, we'll have a 200, 250 pound uh, uh, animal to deal with. And so we developed the process of creating a, we've got a lot of clay in our soil. So it's easy to hand dig a uh, a container for the remains to go in. And we put 100 gallons of wood chips in, put the the dead you in, put another 100 gallons of wood chips in and put a dirt cap on top of that and then plant an oak tree mm. so that her body with the wood chips becomes soil to nurture that new tree coming online, which will eventually be producing acorns that will feed her descendants. I mean, that that's just a fundamental operation of what we're doing. So when natural organic reduction got legalized for the state of Washington, it was just a natural thing. We were already a licensed uh, cemetery, have been licensed since 2015. So it was a natural operation to just extend what we were doing with the animals and just do that with people. Uh, we developed an above ground capacity to do that. Uh, so we can do either in ground or above ground, depending upon what someone's goal is. If their goal is to go back to nature and be part of the forest, then the in-ground option is the best option because that's like proceeding directly to grow. <laughs> so right. so you, we, we can get you. Our, our forest is a very dynamic living forest and it wants to reclaim any situation. So we'll rapidly see uh, new trees coming up on the graves anyway. 
Uh, we also have developed techniques that will allow you to have a tree that is sentimentally important to you uh, on, on things. So we, we've got, uh, we're a forest that combines, uh, we're a transitional forest to go between the wet forest of, of Western Pacific Northwest and the highland forest of the East. So we're, we intentionally settled right here because it is this point of transition where multiple things are happening. It's a diverse uh, ecosphere. And so we've got pine and fir and oak are our primarily forest. But we've also been adding in new types of, of stuff to enhance the diversity of the forest because we want the, uh, the animals and particularly the bees, et cetera, to have a broad range of food resources. So we've we've got uh, lots of other kind of trees, from dogwoods to uh, as aspen to uh, cherries to plums, uh, crab apples, uh, uh, elderberries, just lots of other stuff growing in the forest, building a diverse forest. Though our name Herland comes from a book that was written in 1915, which which imagined a society where the food and the fuel and the fiber come from the forest instead of fossil fuel based agriculture. So how to put all that together and do it in, in the context of an ongoing sustainable nonprofit community. Uh, that's what we're studying and that's what we are. How much support do you get from uh, government officials, state officials in this process? Was it, was it a, uh, a big hurdle to overcome getting the approval to to do a burial like this or a transition like this? Well, what happened was that, that the law was passed. Uh, and uh, at that point, uh, since we were already with the cemetery board because of our, our cemetery and, and said, okay, you guys, what are you wanting to do? What's going on here? Uh, what do you know about this? And they said, we really don't know anything about this. And, uh, I come from a, a, a tradition, a culture where that says that complaining is a form of volunteering. <laughs> and so they said, OK, well, how should it be done? How do you think it should be done? Uh, so that was right at the opening of COVID when everything was kind of shutting down. So uh, we have our own you know, uh, facility here, uh, our own workshops and land and, and stuff. So just use the time to build an NOR facility based upon historical uh, engineering skills. Uh, there's a saying uh, that the only thing new is the history you don't know. Mm. Uh, and so studying, knowing how, how things were done, we just adapted. Uh, people have been kind enough to say they can be very inventive. I'm just, just simply informed and adaptive because uh, I know how things have been done in the past and I can go from, you know, I have this eccentric theory that humans are a type of mammal and so adapting the processes we developed for mammals was really simple to simply uh, make adjustments uh, for the sensibilities of dealing with with humans and loved ones. But nature doesn't care. <laughs> nature sees your body as just another mammal <laughs> as far as that goes. Uh, so uh, they were they were eager to find out we were a stakeholder in the development of the administrative rules, uh, uh, how to do all this stuff. And uh, the, the cemetery board has been very kind working with me. I'm an engineer. I, I'm from the background of sustainability stuff. And every field has its own peculiarities. And there are 50 different jurisdictions on cemetery facilities in this country. Hmm. And so everyone has their own wrinkles and stuff. So uh, they've been kind enough to be patient with me to call them up and say, well, how do we do this? <laughs> uh, you know, because uh, th there's a, a saying in, in, uh, in the nautical world about keeping it between the navigational beacons so that you don't run into the, <laughs> into the banks. And so that's been, they've been kind enough to help me where the questions are when something's coming up that I don't have experiential familiarity with, uh, then uh, they've been kind enough to answer the questions and say, yeah, it makes sense, but you can't do that. Uh, so, so for people that don't understand what organic natural reduction is, it's it's burying a, a human outside of a casket. Is that correct? Well, that's that is natural burial. Okay. In natural burial, you don't use embalming. 
you don't it, 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 and that uh, burial is very much about kind of being in death denial and and trying to pretend and that death hasn't happened etc uh, in natural burial you don't embalm the body go ahead and let it naturally decompose uh, you do not put it inside of a, a, a coffin uh, made from wood from the rainforest and stuff you don't put it inside a concrete vault uh, which is how almost all burials are done and and so it, it's just a body in the ground, uh, which arguably is actually uh, very much involved with the traditions in Judaism and with Islamic culture of doing burials exactly that way. And we're set up so that if you know, we're 80 miles east of the Portland airport and when a body lands, we can have it in the ground in five hours wow. And because there, there are cultures that want the burial that quick. So, and so we can do that if that's what they want. Or we, we've got our own refrigeration facility and we can hold the body for a couple of weeks while loved ones gather from around the countries to have their own ceremony in, in, in the forest. And we've had funerals that last three days. Mm. Uh, you know, we got a campground, come spend time. Uh, one thing we're trying to work against is this rush, rush, rush thing that happens in so much of the modern world. Uh, and no, take your time because grief doesn't work on a clock, uh, maybe a calendar, but not a clock. You know, people need time to absorb the fact that there's, there's a huge hole in your the fabric of your family when a key person dies. And it takes time to knit that fabric back together. There'll always be a, a, a flaw there, a, a loss, a, a gap, but we gotta go on and mm -hmm. how to cherish and yet endure. Uh, is what we got to do. And so we try and give people time to do that. We have people who come and camp out uh, beside the grave of, of their loved one, just spending time. Mm. Uh, we have picnic tables in our forest so that people can come up and picnic and hang out and spend time and tell stories and stuff. So we're, we're trying to help people take uh, a, a more personal, uh, organic approach to the process of dying. Can you walk me through the process of of what it because you mentioned one that uh, one process that involves the in ground and then there's one above ground is what right. you said right so what's that process look like? Well, the above ground we we have a device we call the cradle, which is a uh, insulated uh, sort of coffin that is uh, has circles on both ends like a spool of thread. And so the coffin can roll back and forth uh, in the tumbling process that's involved in composting. So we go ahead and put the body in, we put, put wood chips in, put the body in, put more wood chips in uh, and seal it up and then let the process start naturally going forward. How long does that's, that take? Well, nature has its own time. Uh, it is faster in the summer and slower in the winter. Hmm. And uh, if everything's below freezing, it's pretty much in hold until it's until the, the the temperatures warm up again. Now there, you know, some of the other people in the field are, do the work inside an industrial park, inside of a heated building with mechanical equipment to speed it up, etc. Again, we don't see the point in in trying to uh, rush nature, let the decomposition process, which is more than just making the body visibly go away. Because uh, most people are wanting to have their remains get into a form that can uh, facilitate the growth of other life. They want to return to the circle of life, not to be isolated from it. And so that just all takes time uh, and breaking things down, but doing it in a manner that uh, is helpful for the environment. For example, someone my age has usually between four and eight grams of mercury in their teeth. We want to pull that out of the biosphere. We don't want that. It's one of the problems with cremation, because when you cremate a body, all that mercury, et cetera, gets volatilized into the air. Hmm. We want to. We don't want that. We want to sequester that material. So, uh, we we let it go. We we tell people that you know count on a year, a natural annual cycle, being the time frame on this, because uh -huh. no matter when, when someone dies, within the next year all of the sequences will be uh, doable naturally. 
rather than having to force them using fossil fuel because most people want to lower their carbon footprint and and becoming a tree is the primary way to do that because the tree will then absorb carbon dioxide from the air and and sequester it in the the roots because half half of a tree is underground right. uh and so they will do that and then you've got the huge mycological network of, of a living forest that will then proceed to grow more biomass based upon the resources inside the body. So what don't, what don't understand is that there's a difference between uh, organics and elements. So every bit of green you see in the forest is a molecule of chlorophyll. And at the heart of every molecule of chlorophyll is an, a single atom of magnesium. And if the tree can't get that magnesium, it can't grow. Mm. It's so getting the minerals back into the forest is an important part. So every time you see a log truck going down the road, that's minerals that have been strip mined from the forest. And without the return of those minerals, the forest is handicapped. It can't go forward without it. And so uh, putting the, the resources back into a form, plants ha don't have a digestion system. They can absorb single atoms. But that's it. And so uh, processing it down to the point where it is absorbable by the trees and the plants uh, is is the is the whole ultimate process. So, yeah, you can you can get a body uh, down to the point where you can't see uh, a flesh, etc., fairly quickly. But to get it ready to actually go back into the biosphere and nourish the, the, the fungi and, and the trees, etc., that takes time. So we, we tell people count on a year. Now, the ones that want to get the comp because this process will will turn a human body into two to three 55 gallon drums of compost. Wow. And most people don't really have any idea what to do. <laughs> with <laughs> That's a lot. Gallon drums of grandma's compost. And so uh, the people who come here will either want to take all of it or some of it or none of it. And. Uh, for example, uh, we had a client last year who, whose mother used to sit uh, by their picture window and watch the fishing boats go by and sip her morning coffee. Well, now the mother's remains are now on the other side of that window in among the shrubs uh, supporting that. And her daughter gets to sit there and have her morning coffee, uh, you know, reminiscing with her mother in the place that her mother loved. So that's an example of wanting to take it all. So yeah. we brought in three 55 gallon drums of compost and it's all worked into the, the their garden right there at the window. Other people will want to have five gallons, let's say, and, and put it with a rose bush uh, at their home. And that's fine. And others will say, no, I just want it to go and nurture a tree uh, in the forest. And we can do that, too. What other inputs do you put into this uh, cradle? that you put the body in. So, um, so specifically when you receive a body, there's this apparatus, I imagine that holds the, the, the human body. And you said you, you, you put wood chips in there, but what else goes into, um, into this cradle? Nope. Nothing. Nothing. Oh, wow. So it's, it's purely wood chips. Is it, oh, is it done over time? Like do you put more every so often or we, we put, we, we, Okay, uh, we're in a situation where the average uh, body that comes to us is between 100 and 150 pounds. However, we live in a time when more and more people are what's said in, in the funeral uh, industry is this person is of size, I, I 300 pounds or something. <laughs> you know? at, at that point, we have to adjust uh, the amount of wood chips and stuff to uh to, to accommodate that much material. Uh, so uh, when it, the body is over 60% water, and as it starts to break down, that liquid comes out, and the wood chips absorb that liquid and hold it there until uh, the bacteria have a time to do their thing, until mm -hmm. the oxygen uh, gets in there and so on. So the, the wood chips are basically a holding material for the uh, the body's resources, while the natural uh, breakdown occurs. Okay, so I guess I assumed walking into this conversation that you would you added the wood chips. There would already be you added the human body and some type of, you know, 
compost already, like some soil in there or something, but it's purely a natural breakdown of the human body inside this cradle. Well, well, so, so the body has about six pounds of bacteria within it. Mm. Uh, You have within your gut, uh, the bacteria that are naturally evolved to dissolve all the food that you eat. And when you stop eating, the bacteria start dissolving you. So the body has what all it needs. It doesn't need anything more. Mm. Uh, it, it needs to maintain moisture. Uh, but the, the wood chips absorb the moisture that's already in the body. So that the, there's, you know, there's some woo-woo about yeah, uh, the organic. But the, the fact is, uh, nature has nature knows what it's doing and is ready to go. Um, now, when I say the wood chips, now the wood chips are from our forest. We, we're, we're stewarding 120 acres of forest. And a living forest, there are trees that die. Uh, and so, for example, in winter, we have huge uh, storms that will break off branches and stuff. And that normally will then build up into a forest, into a bed of fuel on the forest floor, so that when a fire comes through, it will be catastrophic Mm -hmm. and it will tend to sterilize things. So we go through the forest and care for it by taking out uh, that dead material and running it through the, the big wood chipper and making the wood chips. So the fungi that are in our forest that are living there, that are half the biomass of the forest, uh, generate spores. And these spores are trapped in the bark of the trees. And then so we grind them all up and put them in there. So the fungi are basically it's self seeding at that point. Hmm. So away you go. So so the reality is it's there. Now, yes, you could speed things up uh, by putting other things in that took fossil fuel to grow you know let's say you're going to put in some alfalfa uh, some other stuff well you know we have a bunch of goats and sheep here who would be rather upset with us to take (laughs) perfectly good food (laughs) and put it in the process when it's not necessary you know uh so are you seeing more support and more interest from um i guess the public in this uh topic well you know it's such a niche issue uh, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, currently 80% of people who die are cremated. And that's rising. Uh, and the projections are that by the end of this decade, 90 some percent of all people who die here will be cremated. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the uh, wholesale facilities out of Seattle that we deal with uh, handled 18,000 uh, dispositions last year. So there's, there's a huge, huge death care industry, the, what's called the funeral industrial complex, that is rocking on and going forward and absorbing uh, all the little independent mom and pop stores. In the whole Portland area, we're talking about two to three million people. There are only three independent funeral homes. They're all rest part of the big corporate situation that handles like some 80% of dispositions in this country are handled by three corporations. Wow. I had no clue. So, so the issue of whatever we do is all a drop in the bucket. Uh, it's marmot. So people who have a passion for the forest and for nature and want to go back that way and don't want to, you know, deal with the, because <laughs> most people's understandings of what do you do when you have a family member die are formed by the movies and the television shows that they see with all the big coffin and all that presentation, et cetera, you know, that stuff, uh, you know, you, this evening's programming is brought to you by, you know, well, <laughs> it is programming and people, that's what they see and into and it as the, the the appropriate way to do that, how to deal with it. Because when a loved one dies, uh, it's chaos for people. Uh, most people know that, yeah, there's, there's, you know, death potential in the future, but the actual happening of it being confronted with having to deal with this, arguably the most loving thing that a person can do is getting their arrangements handled ahead of time mm. so that their loved ones don't have to worry with all that mundane issue and the pressure that the uh, commercial interest can bring on you to upsell you to, uh, 
to a fancier coffin or all of, those are not decisions that you know most people don't know what their parents want for christmas mm. let alone have any idea what their parents want for their funeral yeah you know, that's kind of sick walt that makes me think about th- these companies that you're talking about making families feel bad if they don't upgrade to that fancy coffin yep. right well most of the people in your community choose this model coffin mm, yeah yeah it, they get you and a lot of, a lot of people go into death care because they feel a calling for helping people who are in obvious such pain and chaos, et cetera. But they they get caught up into the corporate structure where they're only evaluated by the corporation on their their cal- their uh, coffin sales and yeah. stuff. And and it, it just eats people up. Uh, most of the people who get their uh, licensure in uh, death care uh, usually are within five years are out of the business. Because it's just emotionally draining, right? Which is one of the things that we we've done by taking this community approach to doing this. Because when I'm dealing with a family that is dealing with a moment, uh, my feelings and needs are, are just not not there. You just have to set yourself aside and care for the people who are in crisis, etc. But you can't give from an empty pocket, hmm. you know. So when they pack up and go home, you know, we go back and work on the garden. And feed the baby goats, <laughs> and and build something, you know. Yeah. So uh, the whole issue of of caring for the the people who are caring for others is central to our approach to what we're trying to do. Can you talk about the price comparison from uh, natural organic reduction compared to uh, traditional burial? I've read two conflicting stories that said that the natural organic reduction. Uh, one story said it's a lot cheaper, and the other one said it's more expensive. Yeah, well, uh, it all depends on who you call. Mm. Uh, you know, so so like I said, we're a five hundred one c thirteen nonprofit. We're a federally recognized nonprofit, and we are working with our own land, etc. We don't have overhead, etc., like the big commercial people have. So we charge three thousand for that. Others charge five. Another charges seven. Another charges eight. Uh, you know, so it all depends on what part you're looking at there. Now, the people who are charging eight don't want you to know about us. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> so, <I> bet not. <laughs> but, you know, what? so yeah, it, it's it's a buyer beware kind of thing. But again, that's the importance of making these decisions ahead of time mm. instead of when you're just in a deep emotional turmoil and highly vulnerable to what, being upsold. What's the cost of a traditional burial? coffin and all that you know that well uh, there are I, i've seen estimates of over because again there, there are different entities involved here because mm. uh, so you have the method of disposition which may be burial maybe natural burial cremation aquamation you know, there's a whole variety of those uh, then there's also the funeral establishments now those are the people who if 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 somebody comes home and they find uh, that their mother's died, they'll call those people and they'll do what's called the first call. They'll come to the house with a gurney, pick the body up and take it to a holding facility. And there things will be sorted out uh, there. The body is held until the medical examiner authorizes the disposition of the remains. And that could be three days. It could be a couple of weeks. All depends. I mean, if it was something that was chaotic uh, and there may be an autopsy, that's going to take longer, et cetera. But the state needs to be satisfied that everything's okay, that we know what the situation is. And then they'll issue a disposition permit Hmm. and then the body can go off. So that all of that other stuff, uh, it can be done by the family. And again, there are 50, 50 some jurisdictions here. So don't take me, but I can tell you in Washington state and in Oregon, the family has total authority over the whole process. They do not have to hire a, uh, a funeral director to, to deal with a the thing. They can handle it themselves. And in many communities, they, they do handle most of it. Uh, they'll take the body, they'll wash it, prepare it, put it in the shroud and, and so on. You can do all that stuff yourself, a lot of people will, will choose not to, to bring in a professional to handle. How do you get a death certificate? How do you get the, you know, all those questions you have no experience with mm. and you don't have used to be an extended families. You had an uncle or somebody 
who'd been through the process. You had ants who would step in and prepare the body and shroud it up, etc. People don't have that anymore. So they have to rely on professionals. Can, from a sustainability standpoint, can you talk about some of the benefits that the uh, natural organic reduction provides to maybe the climate, to the soil, to animals compared to a traditional burial? Well, it, it all comes down to the trees. Uh, trees are what provide us with our life support system. Uh, both the oxygen we breathe, much of that comes from the trees, the forests, uh, and the, the forest products, the house we live in. You know, look around you, how much wood is around you, et cetera. And that's, that's an essential part of how we live our lives. So giving back to the forest, uh, to me, is, is uh, just in a, in a, it's respectful mm. <laughs> and it's, it facilitates life going forward. Absolutely. So, but in, in most cemeteries, you go in and you see they're just regimented rows where there's bodies in the ground inside of uh, concrete vaults and they don't help the environment at all. Mm. Uh, and the reason for the concrete vault is that if you if you don't without that, it's like an upside down container put down over the coffin that will then prevent the earth and the coffin, et cetera, from creating a, a dip. Uh, and that allows them to take a riding lawnmower and mow the, uh, go back and forth and mow the cemetery. Interesting. And uh, that's the point of it. Uh, mm. There's no public health benefits. It's just how to how to keep that nice, even lawn effect. Is that well? What can I tell you? <laughs> Is your organization? Do y'all work with other governments around the country or other cities, other states? Uh, to transition or implement this type of of burial we have talked with a number of uh legislatures okay. uh, or it's more a matter of like a a state senator will call us and want some background information on what what are the pros and the cons and how, how to go forward on it are there any states that are have recently contacted uh you or your your organization and that are interested in we, we had talked with uh, some folks out of New York was the last one we talked to. They just passed their, their new law. Yeah. I saw uh, that really recently. Yeah. So do that's you know, an example. do you know how many States are in are total have approved this method? I think six, six. Wow. Yeah. It seems like there would be more accepting of this. The people would be wanting to do this, especially with the climate talk and the sustainability talk. If there's all these benefits and supposedly, uh, all these negative uh, associations with uh, traditional burial or even cremation. Like I, I've read something like how much CO2 emissions come from cremation compared to this. It seems like people would be more open-minded to this, uh, this method. People are, doesn't mean the financial establishment is. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tricky road, huh? Well, in, 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 uh, Tennessee, you're required to get 1,600 hours of training before you're licensed to braid hair. Wow. So they make it nearly impossible. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So the vested interests are always, I mean, you know, uh, vested interests are what arguably uh, maintain the world. Hmm. So if you're going to go contrary and, and get into people's uh, financial issues, you're going to get pushback. Are there any cons associated with uh, this way? Are there any is there anything bad or anything people need to be aware of? Not that I know of. Uh, you know, our our competitors are are just more expensive, hmm. uh, and they they uh, they don't finish the process. And from my standpoint, of the sense of we we've, we've got a whole forest right here, uh, and we're happy to put them in and grow wildflowers and stuff. Uh, so, you know, we, we believe that we're taking it to the full extent, but the others, you know, they, they, they do a, a good product. There's not a problem there. It's just yeah. a matter of money. Absolutely. Why? I mean, what's, what makes the cost difference? So, uh, so wide, why are they so much more expensive? Are there are more people involved we're, or we're, well, we're nonprofit, they're for profit. Okay. Pretty but straightforward. Yeah. Pretty straightforward. Well, man, this has been an interesting conversation, Walt. I, I greatly appreciate your time. What else um, uh, is your organization on social media? Uh, can people follow y'all? We've got a large website at herlandforest.org. 
which would invite uh, people to check out and talk about. Uh, that's the primary issue of uh, we did more dispositions last year than we did in the previous five years. Hmm. I mean, we're, we're, this, this is something that we wound up getting called to do. It's not something we set out to do. Uh, we recognized that we needed some way to handle uh, the the death of our our people internally under our control, and we're happy to provide that service to others. Uh, and so, it's it, we've been just kind of moving forward with this thing very organically uh, and growing. And uh, we're currently uh, doing what we can to expand our ability to offer this service right through the winter. Uh, you know. So winterizing our process is what we've been currently doing, et cetera. Uh, the big thing is that we're exploring this issue of a uh, an intentional community involved in death care. Because uh, the whole process of serving people who are grieving uh, and helping them with that process and, and taking it away from a dollar-based scenario, how do you do that? And how can the people give uh, without having a support system for themselves. Uh, so, cause you know, when people get a job, they need money to pay rent, need money to buy food. Well, we own our own land. We have our own sawmill. <laughs> We've got our own <laughs> stuff. Yeah. You, you want more, well, not in the bedroom, build it right there. You know, we've got it. So people who want to take a hands-on sense of, of impact with the world can be more giving. Cause if you have a sense of comfort that you know that, you know how the food uh, is there and, and how, how your life support system works. You can be more calm and less stress or deal with the stress that does come your way in a more wholesome manner. Absolutely. I think the work so, you all are doing, Walt, are, is, is very important. And uh, I, love every, I love everything. I love the messages you all put out. I love the information that you have on your website. So I, I think it's important and I'm, I'm happy to be able to talk to you today. Well, if, if it needs some of your listeners sound, this makes sense to them, I'd be happy to talk with them because, again, we're we're trying to uh, build a working model of a better way. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate your time, man. I know you're a busy guy. I'll let you get back to it, buddy. Thank you. Awesome, Take man. Take care. You have a good one, man. Talk to you later. Bye.